So if I wanted to make a living uh, as a musician here, well, I knew I was going to start. So I went to school in Utah Valley University, or what's now Utah Valley, and got a degree in business. And yet I knew that there was something else over there and I, I missed the music really badly, you know? And also I wanted to make a difference in the world. So after I graduated, I had my wife and I got married and we went to the East Coast so I can pursue a master's degree in diplomacy because I wanted to make a difference. Welcome to Latinx in Power, a podcast hosted by Thaisa Fernandes. Welcome to Latinx in Power. Today we are talking with Gonzalo Peña. Gonzalo is a dynamic storyteller with a talent for innovative leadership. With a diverse background that spans Wall Street, the United Nations, and the Utah Opera, Gonzalo brings a wealth of experience to his work as an innovation and leadership specialist. Welcome, Gonzalo. Thank you. Hola, mi gente. <laughs> Amazing. I'm very excited with this episode. In this episode, we explore Gonzalo's strategies for driving growth and achieving goals through strategic storytelling and innovative leadership. Whether you are a seasoned professional just starting your career and journey, so I think you're going to learn a lot. I'm going to learn a lot for sure. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> What does it mean to be a Latino for you, Gonzalo? It means magical roots and roots of love that reside not only in Latin America, but also Europe and Africa. And uh, it's a collection of stories that really define me, define, have defined my family, and that I can communicate with other people. You know? And uh, one of the things that I love about our culture is that Even if someone, say, was born in, in China and, and all of a sudden starts hanging out with people, with Latinos, say, oh, do you want to join us? Fine, join us, you know? <laughs> and uh, as long as you're, you know, really part of the group and you're not just taking away, bienvenido, bienvenido. I love that about us, you know? The whole cliche about mi casa y su casa is something that we should not forget as a, as a culture. We need to have that thing defining us still, that we welcome people. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, totally. We take this uh, Mi Casa Su Casa very seriously. And I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. And I love what you said about a collection of stories. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing. How has your background in life experience shaped your approach to leadership and innovation? So I have a very eclectic background. In Venezuela, I studied 12 years of musical theory. My dad was a musician. I lost him last year, but he started singing for a living when he was 12 years old. So I thought I was going to be just like my daddy. When I got my student visa to come to the U.S., I told him, Dad, I can fulfill my dream and study music and be like you professionally. Back then, there wasn't a professional degree of music in Venezuela. So, and my dad looked at me and said, you get your degree in business and then do whatever you want. <laughs> so I grew up watching my dad have five different jobs to support us. You know, I didn't have the same talent as my dad because he could play like five different instruments and he was a great choral arranger. You know, he was a choir director as well. And those things didn't come easy to me. So if I wanted to make a living as a musician here, well, I knew I was going to start. So I, went to school in Utah Valley University, or what's now Utah Valley, and got a degree in business. And yet I knew that there was something else over there and I, I missed the music really badly, you know? And also I wanted to make a difference in the world. So after I graduated, I had my wife and I got married and we went to the East Coast so I can pursue a master's degree in diplomacy because I wanted to make a difference. The program I chose was a university called Seton Hall University, a small Catholic university that some people remember it because it has a prominent basketball team, but I had never heard of it. And I chose it because I wanted to work in the United Nations. And back in the day, they had a very close relationship with them. I thought if I wanted to make a difference in the world, let's go to an organization that, that is doing that. And uh, I was able to do that. So I was able to work in the in two different agencies of the United Nations. And all of a sudden, this son of a musician and a secretary from the third world country, namely Venezuela, was 
witnessing meetings with world dignitaries and diplomats. And I even met the Secretary General of the UN once. And to me, it was such a great experience. He exposed me to good and bad leadership at the same time. And I learned a lot. Through the years, I, I knew that I wanted to communicate something to my people. So when my wife and I moved to the Western United States, moved back to the Western United States in Utah, I had to start from scratch and I decided to commit myself to the Latino communities here. And that has made a, a difference in my life. And Gonzalo, how was for you this process where you told your father about what you wanted to do, which was study music, and then he said to you, oh, you should <laughs> actually study business? My dad, he only had a, the equivalent of a sixth grade education for him. And my mom, the uh, equivalent of ninth grade ed education. But they were people who really believe in education, formal education. And my, so I have aunts and uncles that were doctors and that are pharmacists and doctors. And, and we really devalue to it. And at the same time, well, I grew up like over the shadow of my dad because he had been a famous singer in Venezuela during the 60s, you know, and part of the 70s. So in the musician world, every time I say Gonzalo Peña, oh, you're the son of Gonzalo Peña. Awesome. And, you know, that I could not measure up. And I thought, well, I could grow in the, in the United States as a musician in my own way. But right now, <laughs> with the limitations that one has as a, in a student visa, that's not going to work for me, you know. So my dad really wanted me to have uh, an easier time that he had as a professional, you know. Whether I'm having it or not, I don't know, but it's the path I chose. And by the way, in 2012, I was able to join the Utah Opera as a singer. And that's that has been my professional experience as a musician. And, and it's been great, you know, being able to, be, you know, to sing on stage with an orchestra. And that has been a great experience. And uh, I've been able to compare both paths. And I'm treasuring the best of both. How's that? I love that your father seems a very, very nice person. We should check him out. I'm, I'm curious to hear his music as well. And I love how you were able to do both, study business and also work with music as well. So you could have both worlds and you were exposed to a lot of different types of leaderships. So this is very empowering and amazing thing to Thank have. You. And how do you see technology shaping the future of innovation and leadership? When I got here in Utah, I started working with, with my community, the Latino community. You know? And uh, simultaneously, this area became a technology hub. And uh, the technology hub that came, which different waves of technology innovation started happening. And that was interesting because there was this we're processing a software called WordPerfect, this the predecessor of Microsoft Word, you know, and it was created here as well. And uh, several companies of software have come here and there is a facility at the northern part of the state that tests rockets for NASA and everything. So what, what I noticed is that our people were not present, you know, and uh, I could not find a whole lot of Latinos. And in, furthermore, in this tech ecosystem, which they call Silicon Slopes, I don't like that name and I don't like the reference to Silicon Valley, but they are investing billions of dollars, you know, and none of that or very little of that is going to the Latino community. I knew that there were foci or people that were working in the tech world and the innovation spaces that were happened to be Latino, but there was no sense of community. So I decided to create a Latino chapter within the organization that represented technology here in the state of Utah. It's called Silicon Slopes, and I formed the Latino chapter. And it was interesting because the people started coming out of the wood woodwork, you know, like, oh, you guys existed? You mean, there? Are, where have you been? I didn't, I didn't think there were other Latinos here. So th that was during COVID, by the way. Uh, so at first, we were only able to, to have online events, and yet a sense of community started building, you know. And that's something I, I'm proud of, that now within the, the technology sector in the state of Utah, and even the, let's say, the, the Western region of the United States, is starting to grow a sense of, of Latinos in the technology sector, you know. And uh, obviously, I'm not the only 
person out there working there. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the people that I recruited for my board are brilliant. There are founders and, and people that are both technology savvy and leadership savvy and with every single one of them, different talents and specializations and competitive advantages. And I, I'm a firm believer in diversity. That's one of the reasons why I picked them. And I recently passed the torch to one of those people I recruited. His name is Mateo Munoz. Un saludo. And I am very proud of what we've accomplished so far. Hopefully, we'll keep accomplishing more and growing our community and, and integrating it more towards the mainstream of uh, the technology ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you created that. And it's interesting. Like You heard people say, oh, I didn't know you exist. It's very interesting, right? Because sometimes... We are first generation or we moved to the U.S. not a long time ago and we feel very lonely. And sometimes it's very hard to say, hi, I'm from Venezuela or hi, I'm from Brazil, because we feel so lonely and we don't know where the other person is from. So we, we get in this very lonely space that we don't see an option to have a community. And when you suddenly have a community, they're like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And it's very hard to be the only one and to feel lonely because a lot of things we are living, we are the first ones in the family living that. You know, I'm one of the few ones in my family, the only one to live in the United States and one of the few who like left Brazil. So a lot of things that I leave, a lot of challenges that I have, I'm the only one having them. So it, yeah. it gets very lonely. Yeah, especially the... Latino immigrant experience is very unique, you know, it's not only because of the language issues, it's because if you want to really thrive in the U.S., you need to adopt new things into your life, adapt to this culture as well. And uh, some people in that process, they lose their own Latino culture or great part of the culture, or just leave it behind. This is not a criticism. It's just sometimes out of the, the sense of survival, you know? And uh, at the same time, the next generation then loses the languages, and m some of them don't even identify as, as Latinos or with the rest of the Latin American culture. You know? And well, that's something we should not attack. We should not criticize. I think that what we need to do is just invite them invite people from other generations of people who don't, that are Latinos, that don't, don't speak Spanish or Portuguese, like, hey, we're still here for you, okay? And whenever you want to join us, bienvenido, bienvindo. Absolutely. Yeah, you touched a really good point, is a lot of times they are losing their Latinidad yeah. just because they are trying to survive, they are trying to achieve their goals. Sometimes they are the only ones. So I think it's a common thing to try to adapt. Yeah. I remember my first years getting really mad because I had an accent and I was like trying to not have an accent. And now I'm like, whatever, I have an accent, you know. <laughs> well, you know, one of my the guests in my podcast, you know, Latino, she's an actress, great person. And, and she actually teach people to improve or to diminish a bit the accent. But she said that a Latino accent is something very personal to you as part of your identity. So you don't need to lose it. You need to maybe adapt it in a way that is easier to the sound. Maravina Jaime is the name. Uh, she has been in great projects with Netflix, Disney, a great actress and, a, and voice actress as well. And uh, that's something I learned, you know, that your voice is an asset that, that is so important. Or as part of your identity, you can adapt it however you want, but you don't need to feel like your voice is any less because you have an accent. I accepted it. I'm grateful for the accent I have. Sometimes in some professional spaces, I'm, I'm going to imitate certain accents, you know, to sound whatever notion of professional that culture might be, you know, but it's something I, I stopped caring about or worrying about because it's part of me and it tells where I'm coming from as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very important the work that you do because other folks who just moved or are feeling insecure, they can feel empowered and yes. inspired by you. So I think this is very, very important as well. And over time, mm. they can they can feel better about being themselves. So maybe like adapting in a way that they can show their Latinidad and yeah. also like uh, adapting to the work culture here. I think this is something that happened with me over time. Now I feel very comfortable. And at the same time, I feel 
and me myself in English and, and <laughs> at work. I'm, I take work very seriously. And if I say I'm going to deliver something, I'm going to deliver. You know, people can trust me a hundred percent. But at the same time, I like to help people. Try to be very kind, and sometimes I make jokes. So this is uh, something that I build over time. So I think hopefully with time. All the other Latinos can build that and feel comfortable in being themselves. I think this yeah. is very, very important. I agree. And there are communities where Latinos are the majority minority. Say, for example, uh, some populations in Texas and California, New Mexico. And, and there it has become more like the norm. But when people from those areas sometimes go to a different locality, different cities, then, then you feel like, oh, my gosh, I actually have an accent. I thought I was normal. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's no need to feel like that. Totally. And what advice would you give to people who are just starting their career journey and want to make an, an impact in their field? So the career that you choose as an undergrad, and talking about formal education, is not as important as the experiences you're going to have while you're study. Obviously, I'm going to invite you to be the best you can be. And the reason why I'm saying this is because life can take you in very many different directions. If you come from a background in which you didn't have access to formal education or to a whole lot of formal education, it's okay because the experiences you get along are still valid, even if they're not paid, even if they're volunteer, even if you are a single mother who has to Uh, work a couple of jobs, do you ha still have to coordinate meals? You have to coordinate schedules. You still have to run a home. And that is a skill that not everyone has. So whatever path you choose, make sure that you appreciate and learn and perfect some skills along with it. If you have the opportunity to have an internship or co-op work, or you have to work while you go to school, Try to get some experience in that field that you want to specialize in. Having said that, you know, I've had to pivot professionally a couple of times in my life. That can be particularly hard and can bring some uncertainty in, in your life. And what I'm telling you now is something I'm still telling myself. Just keep the next step and uh, make sure that you find a balance between what you wish and what's possible. But hear me out. It's still okay to shoot for the stars and take it from a Venezuelan who ended up working in the United Nations, you know. Uh, so not all the dreams you have might be fulfilled, but still great dreams can be achieved by you. You just need to keep going at it, you know, and be grateful for the opportunities you're having and, and still aim high no matter what. And the road might not take you what you expected, but still it's going to be a great road if you choose it to be. Incredible. Thank you. You're very proud and inspired by hearing you. And I love what you said about a balance between what you wish and what is possible. And I get that, especially I feel when you're younger, we might get frustrated about a lot of wishes yeah. and the possibilities, right? But we, we have a lot of time and things can change a lot over a short period of time. And I think something that I'm seeing in this podcast, like hearing so many stories that sometimes I think, oh, this person planned their entire life. Everything happened. And I was like, no, they are like trying to figure around pivoting and finding new stuff. And now everything makes sense. But like 10 years ago, it didn't make sense, uh -huh. you know. But when we see it, the reality now, we're like, oh, my God, they planned it. Like, no, and that's okay as well. Because I don't know, thinking about myself, And what I planned to do when I was in college and what I do right now is like, oh, my God, that's so different. <laughs> But so at the different. same time, we didn't have a school to do what I do right now, which is program management. There is no formal education about no, it. No, it's experience pretty much, isn't it? Yeah. There are things, in fact, that I, I never learned in formal education And there are some skills, especially regarding creativity and innovation. Many educational systems do not teach children, do not teach us to be creative or how to be creative or innovative. You're supposed to follow a regiment, you know. I'm not going to criticize any system in particular, but 
you can still learn it. And one of the things I, by which I adopted innovation and creativity in my life was with the Boy Scouts of Venezuela, actually. When you have projects that you need to take on or tasks that you need to perform, and all of a sudden you, you find yourself not knowing what to do next, then there is a part of your brain that needs to start thinking, okay, what do I do now with what little I have? That is a skill in itself. You know, I think that's the, the root of creativity is doing something with what you got and something of quality and of value. Incredible. How do we stay motivated and inspire others to adopt attitudes and mindsets that foster success? So I'm not going to lie, and, and my wife knows this very well. I am very hard on myself. That's not a trait I'm proud of. And sometimes what I'm telling your listeners and whoever is listening now and the listeners of my podcast, Igno Latino, is something I'm telling myself sometimes on, or the list of lessons I've learned or I'm still learning. Don't be too hard on yourself. And one of the things to accomplish that is avoid comparing yourself to others, you know. I'm following um, an influencer who happened to be a female F-16 pilot super cool stuff and the videos she shows of her piloting her, her jet along with the rest of the squadron is awesome and all that and and then one day she said discover the power of comparing yourself to others and i my jaw dropped like what no and i even made a comment very respectful you know i i know what you're coming from but i'm afraid that you might alienate people with this and uh, i'm here to tell you that is not necessary you can have a point of reference you know, where you want to get and where, how you want to be. But if you keep you comparing yourself to others, that is only going to bring you frustration because there's always, always going to be someone who is better than you at something, a skill and a career, a contest, a competition, something. So have your goals, set them, work really hard for them. And uh, obviously, you're, there are situations in which it is a competition, it is a race, and you're trying to get first place. But if you just keep basing your self-esteem on your place relative to others, that's going to make you miserable and unhappy in your life. You know, give yourself credit from what you have accomplished. You know, on the way, help others get to the same level or even better. You know, that's leaving a legacy. The world doesn't tell us that, you know, especially the media. When we see, you know, sports gods, Michael Jordan, uh, I don't know, Serena Williams. Uh, and I'm not saying that these are right people at all. You know, these are great accomplished people that have worked hard. But for crying out loud, growing up while studying music theory, I was comparing myself to Mozart and Beethoven, you know, and I was surrounded by, by geniuses that were getting picked for contests uh, in Europe. And I was just feeling that uh, I was inferior just because I wasn't accomplishing the same thing as them. That's not healthy. That, it's not necessary. You can carve your own path and it's going to take hard work anyway. And that's going to take discipline. But also take time to think how you've affected other lives and to recognize that, okay, I've done this and I'm proud of what, what I've done and I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had. Incredible. And this might be a continuation of what you just said, but I'd love to think about this question and hear others. So which advice would you give to your younger self? You're better than you think you are. And not everything is your fault. You know, I felt I grew up feeling responsible for everyone around me. And uh, I think that is good to feel a sense of responsibility for your community, your family, you know. But it's not good to feel that you have bad things that happen are because of you all the time and that you should have done better just because someone chose not to be better. You know? And I've had to carry that and learn that through years, even right now with this community that I'm trying to move forward or my podcast, for in instance, you know better than, than me, you know how hard it can be to have a good following or people listening and it's okay. Do your best and be grateful that you're able to do your best. Love it. And which resource helped you in your journey? Do you have any tip for us? It can be anything. Dude, I love this question because I really like movies that inspire us. So, for example, in 2016, there was a film that came out here in the, in the U.S. that was called Spare Parts. 
that film in itself was the one who, who motivated me to pursue a path of integrating Latinos in the technology ecosystem. And it's a story about four Latino high school students in Arizona. A couple of them were are actually undocumented. They are part of the robotics team at their high school, you know, and in a very rough neighborhood, very poor resources. And they decide to compete in this competition about aquatic robotics, you know. And this is Arizona. It's not like they have the sea right there. So, so they create a robot and go against this top universities, including MIT, you know, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they end up winning, beating those, those guys titans of technology. And, and these are Latino high school students, you know, competing against college students from top colleges in the United States. And, and to me, it's like, dang, they don't know it, but they have inspired so many people because sometimes we don't see as Latinos that any evidence that we can make it big, you know, our communities, sometimes we only see poverty. We only see violence. We only see mediocrity, bad leadership, you know, and vice. And, and we don't think that as a people, as a community, have the potential to achieve, to get to top spaces and to become world leaders at something, except for the rappers or the really exceptional athletes, you know. It doesn't have to be like that, you know. And the measurements can vary and we can achieve great things. And if we can let others know by giving a good example or telling the stories of those who achieved as well, that was one of the things that made me happy in this world. That's why I started the you know, Latino podcast, as a matter of fact. Incredible. We have a movie to watch. Thank you so much for your time. I learned a lot and feeling very inspired now. So thank you thank for you. that. <laughs> I would leave the last minutes for you to share where people can find you. And we are going Certainly. to link to the description of this episode, everything you said as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I operate mainly on LinkedIn, or LinkedIn. <laughs> so Gonzalo Peña. And uh, also, if you Google Igno Latino podcast, that's I-N-N-O Latino podcast. We're going to find me as well. And the whole idea is that you get inspired in every single episode. So I know you're going to love it. Amazing. I love your podcast. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much for sharing. And yeah, feel free to share your thoughts with Gonzalo. So he speaks English, Portuguese, and Spanish, whatever language you prefer. So we were talking <laughs> in Portuguese before we started to record this episode. So that's incredible. Thank you Thank so you. much, Gonzalo. Thank you, Thaisa. It's such a great pleasure. And please know that I would love to come back to your podcast on future endeavors, creative endeavors that you engage into. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate I love to hear your story. It's very, very inspiring. And I love everything you said. So you give me a lot of things to think. And I'm just starting my morning. So it's, it's amazing to feel inspired. <laughs> Thank you.